we are going to have about 40 minutes uh, to have a discussion. And the topic of the discussion is architect architecting for the edge. Uh, but the main promise of edge computing that lies in bringing the data and processing closer to the end user, um, and the, with the edge being divided very, very broad, uh, ranging from the, from the very ultra small user uh, distance to the user with a, with a home sensor, so a car. And the edge can also range all the way to the network edge, the internet um, uh, in the, at, at the interconnection side. Uh, in the today's product landscape and infrastructure landscape, there is a growing number of use cases uh, with IoT, autonomous driving, and many others, and also many infrastructure solutions and options. Um, those the, the problems that we have to solve are in need of infrastructure and software architecture solutions, and we're going to have a discussion on that. Uh, and if we, in the conversation, our goal is to learn how to do it right and what mistakes to avoid. And I'm pleased to be joined by the great set of panelists, uh, Max, Cal, and Jason, uh, who bring a lot of experience in the field. And let's start with a brief introduction from which uh, one of you and uh, Kyle, would you mind uh, starting and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Kaladhar Vurugandi. I'm a senior fellow in the office of the CTO at Equinix. Right. Thanks a lot, Kyle. It's really nice to have you here. Uh, Jason, uh, what we, if we go with you? <clears throat> yeah, hey, everybody. So uh, Jason Shepard, um, I uh, lead uh, ecosystem efforts at a company called Zadita. We're focused on edge orchestration. Uh, my motto is, if it's fuzzy, I'm on it. I always tend to find myself on the front end of emerging technologies, uh, you know, IoT, uh, uh, prior to this, and now, of course, edge computing. So definitely look forward to chatting with you guys. All right. Awesome. Looking forward to the conversation as well. And Max, nice to see you again uh, after your uh, great presentation earlier. Uh, but not everyone has a chance to see it, so let's do the entry again. You missed out is all I can say about that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm Max, folks. I am one of the co-founders of GraphCDN, and we provide GraphQL caching as a service. Um, so we operate in 60 metro level edges, and we edge cache people's GraphQL APIs. Nice. Yeah, nice to see you again, Max. Um, so as uh, many of you know, with edge computing, it's, it's a big uh, uh, area, and it's been expanding. Uh, the set of benefits that, that it, it can provide is also pretty broad and pretty wide. Uh, some talk about the performance benefits, others talk about scalability, uh, efficiency, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start with a simple question uh, for Jason, Kyle, and Max. Like, what's your favorite benefit, if you wish, and maybe with some of argumentation, like where you see the, benefit, uh, the main benefit of the edge for you? And uh, uh, yeah, Jason, what do you mind starting? I mean, I yeah, I'll start. I mean, a lot of what we see, obviously, you know, latency is is a you know a key benefit. Um, we see fairly often because uh, you know, edge is a continuum, and there's there's different locations, and we should definitely unpack that a bit as well. Um, we see pretty often that bandwidth is a is a big concern. Um, it costs a lot of money to move data around uh, blindly. The internet was initially architected for download centric use cases, but with IOT and you know, all the different new data being generated, everything's you know, flipping to being more upload centric and you have to change how net uh, networks are architected. Uh, computer vision is, is a killer app for edge because the only people that think sending raw video data over networks, uh, is a good idea are people that sell you network connectivity. Um, so that whole notion of, of just the bandwidth constraints of being able to pump all this data up to the back end for, for centralized processing is, is a big driving factor in addition to things like latency and, and security and some other stuff we'll talk about. But yeah, bandwidth is a, is a big one. Yeah, hi. yeah so I completely uh, agree <laughs> with Jason. Uh, bandwidth and uh, latency. Latency, I just want to... Uh, double click a bit on latency. I think the, there is a spectrum of latency uh, latencies that people are interested in. There are what I call a, a quote unquote real time hard constraint latencies where you would probably have to have your edge in the factory or in the hospital operating room, et cetera, infrastructure. And then I would say there are probably the less than 20 millisecond round trip latency. And a lot of the video use cases that are coming up fall into that. And for the, those type of latencies, definitely, I think the the in the spectrum of these edges, the metro level edge where you're doing interconnection, 
it's a very good uh, location for doing uh, you know that kind of latency range so latency is also i think we have to tease it apart and based on the use case there are different uh, edge locations where you can process them i think for us for our customers it's definitely the performance and latency it's right like e-commerce companies users news websites users and for them it's it's mainly about performance right they have their data centers usually in us east one right classic virginia data center have the database there and their whatever it is woocommerce engine right and for them it's really about distributing all that data around the globe in those 60 meter level edges and then having fast performance pretty much everywhere now it's not like a hospital operating room or, or anything else like Carl mentioned, where it's really, it has to be real time, otherwise someone dies. But still, in the, for those use cases, milliseconds mean money, right? And there's a, there's a trade-off to be made where on the continuum you go with those. And I'm sure we're going to dive into that. And then I've also got to underline the bandwidth benefits. Um, I think that, that Jason mentioned that a lot of our customers are seeing huge bandwidth savings by not having to go halfway around the world every single time someone wants to load a web page. And I think that also is a huge consideration. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was going to add, like, so a lot of people ask me, well, with 5G, it's so fast, you know, that's edge computing is a fad, it's going to go away, because, you know, 5G just solves all your problems. But what people don't realize is it's their hyper like, their hyper local connections, you know, the last hundreds of feet, and you still have the same bottleneck upstream of that hyper like local connection. So you actually have to, it drives more need for edge computing, you have to filter out the data before it starts to clog up the the bottleneck that you've just created upstream. So, uh, but yeah, and I've also heard a lot of people say that 5G is going to help you drive your car from the cloud, which is insane. You know, that's, <laughs> a, that's a latency critical workload, as Cal was saying, that you're always going to see on-prem, but you would augment that with services, you know, for like augmented reality, infotainment, et cetera. Et cetera. It's a big, big point that he made is latency critical versus latency sensitive. Yeah. Very different. Yeah, Jason, I think that's, that's a great point. It, uh, just a quick uh, note for the audience. I think the range of benefits that we can get from edge computing is pretty broad, uh, but we uh, we only have 40 minutes and then yeah. we give at least some of the practical advice on uh, how the architects and software engineers can approach problems. So I think for this discussion, uh, let's uh, narrow things down to latency and some of the related aspects. Like as uh, uh, was mentioned, there are some of the interconnections, but let's focus on latency as the main benefit. And uh, the plan for the discussion is to go a little bit through the advice of how to approach design, uh, designing the application and running the, uh, the application and service, and then what are the problems to avoid. Uh, the discussions will be largely pre-programmed, uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll see if I can integrate them into the discussion. Or if not, we'll, we all will join the uh, Zoom Hangout uh, towards the end. And if, you, uh, if anyone from the uh, attendees want to uh, discuss more, uh, there will be an opportunity to do that as well. Uh, so yeah, going back to the topic. So focusing on latency, and let's imagine that I, I want to uh, develop a uh, a service application. I have a specific problem, whatever it could be. Uh, but then I'm immediately faced with a lot of options. Like, and first question is, where do I run my logic? Like, do I stay in the device? Uh, do I stay on the CDN? Do I stay in the? There are also many CDN options. Like, do I stay somewhere in between? I think there is a growing kind of uh, range of hierarchy of edges. Uh, that's that's evolving. Uh, so I'm curious if you have any uh, advice, any thoughts, or any. Uh, first type questions that uh, an architect should answer to themselves. I mean, yeah. go, ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay. So, so the way I look at the edges is as a hierarchy. So you can have thousands of, or even higher number of edge device, like device level edges. Then you have maybe hundreds of what I call as micro or, or you know far edges, like they could be parking lots or basement of an apartment building or a stadium, etc. Then you have few metro level edges, which is one in every NFO city type of like metro level edges. And then you have these huge large scale public clouds. So one of the first questions you have to ask is for this type of application in this hierarchy where, you know, you are like, it's like a tree. You can think of it like a, a you know, inverted tree from a cost standpoint, from a performance standpoint, from a security standpoint, where should I place my processing? So that's the first question. Where in this hierarchy should you place? Because for cost reasons, it might be more optimum to go up in the hierarchy and, 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 and then still be able to satisfy the latency requirements. Right? So that's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that not every microservice in your application needs to be satisfied with the same latency. 
So you can basically have some microservices running at the device level edge. Some can potentially go up in the hierarchy and run in a metro level edge, and some can be even in the you know deep public clouds, right? So, so those are two points: cost uh, or where in the hierarchy you should place it, and also the, it's not just everything has to go in one single location. You can actually straddle your microservices across this hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, and so it's, it really is. It's about about a balance of cost and performance. There's also the old uh, adage: it depends. You know, like we, we don't know yet, and which is also we'll talk about you know the architectural principles that that are important to to, to look at um, today, so that you just don't know in all cases. But the way I would summarize it, it, if it's it's a balance of, you know, is it latency critical, latency sensitive? And is it focused on a given asset or very location centric, or is it across a bunch of different users? So if it's if it's latency sensitive, but you need to serve a bunch of users, you're going to do it at metro or regional areas because you're a little upstream, you've but you still got that balance between better latency but still upstream of lots of users. If it's latency critical or very locations or asset specific, you're going to run it on prem, you know, on the factory floor, in the car. You know, you know, I probably would not want my airbag deployed from the cloud. Um, actually, strike probably. I would not want my airbag deployed from the cloud. <laughs> um, but but anyway, so it's it's that balance. But but where things run along that continuum or the hierarchy, it really depends on you know, balancing the trade offs. And it might change over time, which is again why you need to think about how you architect systems today to to be able to uh, you know be flexible with it. I think that's really interesting. For for us, there's like a strong trade off between how much can we cache versus how small do we go at the edge level, right? If we had an edge for every single user, the caching would be pretty much useless because you couldn't share any of that data, right? Like might as well not cache in the first place. But maybe there's like a trade off right there where metro level might be too coarse, right? Maybe it's it's slower than it needs to be compared to the cache rate rate trade off, which I think is really interesting. Um, Definitely, lots of traders are traders everywhere, right? Like, like Jason said, it depends as always. Yeah, and I think I, I'm going to follow with. I, I, there was a great question in the chat about uh, trying to unify the interface and the logic across uh, layers of the edge or between edge and the cloud. I'm curious if you have any uh, advice on that. Uh, and I guess here there could be a trade-off between uh, latency and uh, graceful degradation if, if for some reason edge stops being available and uh, some of the complexity uh, of the overall system. I, I think I think uh, as as uh, Jason said, it's it's it depends on like the state of the application. If you have to satisfy multiple users, you have to go up in the hierarchy. State is critical. Also, data aggregation requirements. If your application is using data from multiple sources. Then mm -hmm. also a lot of times you have to go up in the hierarchy to a metro or a cloud to do the aggregation, and also compute uh, basic sh sheer compute requirements. If you have to crunch through a lot of you know data and processing, um, you know increasingly you know you can you can have more dense power racks uh, at higher up in the hierarchy in the metro or in the clouds, right? So definitely certain tasks like uh, AI model training, um, you know. There's preference, like there are new techniques coming which can push that also to the edge or far edge. But definitely, I would say, for from AI standpoint, more training is getting done at Metro or, or the clouds. Uh, but inference, definitely, you can push it. Uh, once you create your model, you can, using a distributed control plane, you can push that train model as far as possible. And again, there are some trade offs, but at a rough, high level heuristic, that's how I look at it. And I, so they're complementary. It's not. It's not like edge versus cloud. It's 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 a continuum, and in many use cases, you got to do both. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll add. So so as part of the continuum, um, you know, it really goes from like super constrained devices. We're starting to see tiny ML being embedded inside of devices. I mean, that's it's compute. It's more fixed function, but. Uh, all the way up to you know, regional data centers, just on the other, other side of the internet exchange. And, and you know, where you place workloads along that continuum, you depends on a variety of factors, as we're saying. But there's uh, actually the, the LF Edge taxonomy white paper. Um, I don't know if we have the link to put in the, the chat, but it's a good read that you know, we put out as a community uh, as part of Linux Foundation last year. And it talks about you know, inherent technical trade-offs as you go through the, the continuum. You know, first, it's, it's are you latency critical? Or are you latency sensitive? That means, are you going to drive it upstream from a WAN across a lot of users? You know, the kind of the service provider edge, as we've called it, 
or you can run it on-prem as, as kind of like an end user because you have to be right there at the services or, or at the point of uh, the subscribers or the systems. The second one is, is it in a secure data center or is it not? You know, if, if it's not in a secure data center, you have to have a very different security story. You have to assume someone can watch it, walk, walk up and touch that that box. So that changes how you approach it. And the third one is, is it so constrained that you have to go embedded with software where everything's custom, all the over there update tools, everything's custom because of the, the footprint of that device? Or can you extend cloud native principles that we've developed you know, in, in these centralized data centers, platform independence, loosely coupled architectures, microservices, et cetera? The whole goal of edge architecture, you know, is, as we see it, is extend cloud native left, so to speak, from cloud to the extreme edge, extend it left to the point where you just can't anymore. And that's driven by memory footprint, generally speaking. It's like a box with a, you call it a, a couple gigs of memory. At that point, you can no longer support virtualization or containerization. You have to go embedded, then it becomes really painful. Everything's custom. And so from an architecture standpoint, what you want to do, I saw the question about separating business logic, separating you know, all these different layers is abstract all of the application plane from the hardware, you know, the infrastructure below, you know, you make sure that you don't get tied in with any given backend service, create all these layers of abstraction and extend cloud native as far out as you can until it just the boxes can't support it, the hardware can't support it. And at that point, if you do that properly, now you can basically, you know, it depends, you don't know today, but your workloads can be transportable across that continuum. So it's, it's really important to be thinking about those layers of abstraction now when you architect these systems. I think the really important part, point, the really important point there is future proofing, right? Even if you're not running at the edge yet, you will be <laughs> very soon, right? There will be workloads that you're going to be running at the edge. And the most important thing you can do now is avoid vendor lock-in or platform lock-in of any kind, right? And be ready to take that application logic you've written and run it at whatever part of the continuum of the edge that makes sense for your use case, right? And that makes sense for your application. Um, and I think that's one of the trickiest bits from an architecture perspective. How do you, how do you ensure that that is future-proof and keeps working at all of those different points? But isn't yeah, it also extremely hard to do because um, ultimately, especially in the newer developing area where that edge computer still is, uh, if we try to generalize or kind of future-proof the APIs, there is very little left to work with and uh, lots of capabilities that might unlock some of the performance benefits or some advanced functionality could be a pattern uh, like vendor specific. Is, is, that, is that a true statement or you see different interesting developments in, in the field that? Uh, that, that would make you disagree. I think for, for our use case of having metro level edge, right? Like we, we use Fastly under the hood, big CDN provider, and they have this computed edge framework now that you can use to deploy to their 60 worldwide edge locations and whatever. Um, but we have to be very careful, right? Like we might not stay with Fastly. We love Fastly, right? Like no, no, <laughs> no plans to move off it at the moment. But eventually, right? Like there's a, there's a world in which we don't use it anymore. And so we have to be very careful with at what level do we write our application logic, right? And essentially for us, it's almost like you, we just have that function that takes a graphical query and the response that we got back and determines how to cache it, right? And then there's the other level, which is the Fastly specific stuff, which is, you know, how do you interface with Fastly system? How do you tag something in the Fastly cache? How do you purge something from the Fastly cache? And we just have to make sure to abstract that properly to the point that we could, in theory, rewrite that small shim layer for any other provider or machine or whatever we use, um, but keep sort of, the hard under air quotes logic of the actual caching and determining of how all, the, all, all of that works. Yeah, I, I actually want to say that if possible, you should architect it for abstract data management principles like where do you do data aggregation, right? Where do you do your data filtering, right? Where do you do your inference? Where do you want to do your training, right? So there are, there are well defined tasks and these can be vendor independent. And, and they can also be edge, quote unquote, independent, like depending on the resources available, the contention level available, the security model that you need, you can move these data processing capabilities across this continuum. And, and I think that's how you should try to abstract the, the design of your application. So that way you're not logged into any single cloud provider, right? You're not logged into any single type of, you know, edge hierarchy architecture, right? Depends, today you have, not enough processing at the, let's say, far edge, 
but tomorrow maybe you will get tons of processing there, right? And then you can say, ah, okay, I, I, sh I should be able to move my inference today because I cannot put um, enough GPUs at that location. I will go a little higher up in the hierarchy and do my you know, model inference for more sophisticated model inference like video inferencing operations. But tomorrow, if more power comes there, you just take that container and then you just plop it in the finer edge. So I think you need to think in abstract data management principles terms and then map it to different vendors and different edges. Yeah, and I mean, even the, the like when it comes down to protocol support. So, so yeah, I mean, clouds are offering great infrastructure. This is not about you know whether cloud infrastructure is good or bad. It's it's what key uh, decoupling points do you decide on? And one is around just data acquisition. So, why do we have thousands of protocols you know, when you consider proprietary protocols coming from like IoT or just the operations world? Because everyone created a proprietary protocol to lock you into their system. And, you know, that's not any real way to scale long term as things, you know, the pace of innovation picks up. And, you know, we're starting to see this big trend towards openness. And, you know, this is a big part of what we're doing within like LF Edge and Linux Foundation is create these open source projects that are driving standard APIs that help you, you know, abstract uh, yourself from these different technologies. So like EdgeX Foundry and Fledge, for example, it's like they're basically protocol brokers between anything to something more modern and common, but it creates this decoupling point that's completely open. So you're not tied to one back in. Um, these are these are those types of tools that you want to you evaluate so that you can make sure that you have the maximum flexibility going forward. Um, and the odds that all use cases within one environment you know, or a supply chain or whatever go to one cloud is pretty much zero. Um, and so you, you have to have basically multi-tenancy from the edge. I think the main thing I hear us all saying is it depends. I feel it like depends. that's just like the, the, the summary so far is all of this depends. <laughs> well, I, I think right now, at least with uh, some of the containerization or unification, uh, there are tools available. Uh, but I think as Jason mentioned, uh, not every layer of the edge is physically capable of running the uh, container of the virtualized infrastructure. And uh, I assume that especially at the last frontier, like at the uh, IoT or like the very end of like, uh, like low end sensors, computer, computing devices, there might just be not physically an option to do that. And ultimately, it's the problem of, of abstraction becomes really hard and you have to decide like whether not to do it or do it and lock you in into the specific capabilities, right? Yeah. There's basically four say so when it comes to orchestration you know and, and underlying tools uh, I, I see four major buckets one is constrained devices that so everything's custom it, it just is what it is but based on the resources of course there's one that's more like kind of centralized to regional data centers just generally a solved problem but we're seeing innovation happening around kubernetes and and you know you have to you know the scale factor gets a little higher when you get out to metro areas of course then another bucket along the continuum is client devices, you know, uh, PCs, mobile you know, devices, tablets, whatever. That's also kind of a solved problem around Windows, iOS, Android, you know. And then there's like all of these devices from IoT gateways to server clusters like that are distributed outside of physically secure data centers. And there's going to be a growing number. It could be on a truck, a retail, you know, stuffed in a closet, in a retail store, on a manufacturing floor. That's very different than data center compute because in the data center, the controller calls the server and says, hey, here's what you should be running, update this. And it has pretty much a constant connection, you know, usually fiber between that controller and the server. At the distributed edge, outside of the fringes of the data center to, to, you know, to the field, you have to assume you're gonna lose connection because you will at, at times. And the box has to phone home, you know, instead of, so it works through firewalls and, and, and nets and stuff like that. And it has to otherwise just keep running if it loses connection. And so it's there's similar principles. You know, we're saying move cloud native out and and it, you know, these layers of abstraction, but necessarily different tools because of it, it, they actually have to operate in reverse. And so these are other considerations. We've seen a lot of people that are trying to take data center tools, like really good stuff, been around for a while, and apply it out in the field, and it falls apart not only because of footprint, but because it actually has to operate in the opposite direction. Yeah, I think Jason, that's uh, that that's actually a very good point uh, on the different layers and some of the complexities. Um, I think at this point might be might make sense to talk about things of not to do. Uh, mm -hmm. 
And uh, if you have seen any anti-patterns anti or the, is there any advice they could generally uh, give to avoid making early mistakes? Yeah, I mean, one clear anti-pattern is uh, uh, historically data was moved to where the compute was located, right? But now I think we are entering a world where compute, because of the size of the data in many cases, you have to move compute to where data is located. And so if the data is generated in the cloud, process it in the cloud, right? If the data is generated at the edge or and as close as possible, uh, depending on the compute power, process it in that close location. So don't move the data that is getting generated at the edge to the cloud to process and vice versa. If the data is getting generated in the cloud, don't artificially move it. Uh, well, you'll have egress costs, but still don't, don't move it and, and process it at the edge. So, so I think that um, that kind of model you need to do. You process move the compute close to where the data is in most cases. Well, I'll start by saying the last thing the world needs is another IoT platform, so don't build one of those. <laughs> we have too many of those. Um, you know, it's all about consolidating. I think, you know, what not to do in general is to, to don't, don't reinvent the plumbing. There's a lot of good tools out there. There's a lot of, you know, good stuff happening through open source. Um, you know, yes, we need more standards, but you know, eventually this is about, you know, I mean, we had like the running joke was there's 500 IOT platforms and now it's kind of blurring into edge. I mean, we don't need 500 platforms. We need consistent infrastructure. And then the winners will have necessarily unique hardware, software, and services around that, that core you know, infrastructure. But, um, you know, in terms of what not to do, don't, so don't, don't reinvent tools that are already there, focus on differentiation, but also having an open foundation isn't just important for, you know, preventing lock-in and things like that, but also the real potential of, of digital over time is all these interconnected ecosystems sort of crossing over, whether it's b 2 to c like retail, insurance, utilities crossing into the home, or it could be, um, uh, you know, supply chains, you know, with the manufacturing, you know, the energy ecosystem, which is actually quite fragile now with the macro trends coming around electrification and all that. What we need is, is more consistent plumbing that that builds trust into how data is exchanged across these different um, ecosystems. And the only way that's going to happen is based on an open foundation. So that, uh, you know, we chatted a bit about it. There's there's uh, work that we're working on within Project Delvarium, um, as an example, like the, building this concept of trust fabrics and how do you start to interconnect things with measurable data confidence. And much longer story, but I, I think the, 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 the main point is there's so much opportunity out there as a developer, I'd say just just make sure to take a look at at you know, some of these macro trends. And even if it's easy to just latch on to some tool set or some cloud to get going, I mean, everybody wants to get to Hello World quick. There's an opportunity cost for, for what you might be able to get to uh, in the long term in terms of, of the different use cases and experiences that we can build. I think I would say very broadly and generally, only move to the edge if you really need to uh, think carefully about your use case because it does come with cost and complexity trade-offs and you can make those trade-offs just fine right and there's tooling around doing that but you have to make sure that you are that that is a thing that your application needs right like you if you don't need that it's just really unnecessary complexity and cost and i would say very generally know when you got to move to the edge if it's latency sensitive or even latency critical absolutely do that um, but unless you have a really good reason it is definitely easier and there's a lot more tooling if you try to stick with a single data center. Yeah, in a perfect world, it would do everything central and you know, it is easier and whatnot, but for a variety of reasons. But um, yeah, and that, that's, but that's also where I, I bring up the, the trust uh, data confidence stuff. You know, the thing, sorry, the link in there is because data that originates to the edge, you can only drive so much value at it if you know where it's been and if it's real. And to do that, you can use edge technologies, edge computing technologies to inject confidence into that data. That's the goal of, of efforts like these. So now you've basically turned security into a profit center instead of a cost center. And you can drive you know, new, new monetization at things and all that. And you know, no, it's not just you know, ledger technologies. Everyone says, oh, put some blockchain on it. Well, blockchain will tell you where stuff has been, but it doesn't tell you if it's real. And so there's a lot of considerations, even, even if it makes sense to centrally process things, there's investments you can make in edge architecture that are just to inject trust into data, if nothing else. And so there's some other considerations beyond just the pure performance and cost benefits. 
Yeah, I think Max, your your reference to like moving to the edge where and see that really reminds me of some of the uh, observations like around the microservices. I think uh, microservices became very popular and uh, very often they were used for a very good reason, but not always. And I think uh, there were many hours of engineering time spent on solving the problem that shouldn't have been solved in the first place. Yeah, yeah. In general, there's a lot of solutions looking for problems out there. <laughs> and and uh, and. So I got one more point to add is what we are also finding is that people are taking more of a data fabric centric view for, for processing. So what I mean by that is that they're not just looking at, uh, you know, the stack in the cloud or stack at the edge. Instead, they're saying, okay, we have all of these different locations from where we are doing compute and potentially data. So they're looking at technologies which are at the fabric level. Like, you know, you have a, uh, like, a, you know, strongly consistent, fabric which is across or you have like an object fabric object storage fabric across all these locations or you have like traditional file systems uh, that are distributed caches across these locations so they're trying to get uh, data or storage not as a single silo not like a single database or not like a single object storage system instead they're looking at it from a fabric standpoint that is spanning across all these different locations so by employing technologies of that type a lot of your state management for your application state management for these stateless containers moving them around etc becomes much easier right and because because the, the underlying fabrics are doing all that heavy lifting for you they are moving the containers they can move the you know the, the replicate replicating the data to a different location or they can cache it to the locations that you want so a lot of the hard work there don't reinvent the wheel there are a lot of fabric solutions available there that you should be piggybacking on and I'm curious what's your thinking on the orchestration tools? Because I think Max, you quickly mentioned about the uh, running and like uh, managing the complexity at the edge. Uh, what's your current thinking on the ways, especially if we go like to the uh, parts of the edge which are closer to the users, like usually goes with an increased number of uh, uh, edge points. Uh, what's your current assessment on, on the state of the field and uh, any uh, insights about that? Do one of you two want to go? I feel like I, I with my metro level edges, I'm the oh. wrong person to answer this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. And I saw the thing about cube edge, the question about cube edge. I mean, there's there's obviously a lot of tools um, you know out there, and and whether they're open source or not. And you know, like I mentioned, there's there's these sort of main paradigms that 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 there's different considerations for. So while there's good things like you know, obviously Kubernetes in general. There's K3S, uh, you know, lighter weight version that people are using, um, you know, for for more distributed edge use cases, uh, Cube Edge. But even from those tools, K3S getting it on a box, much less a thousand times, you know, those distributions, it's not easy. And so I think people also tend to forget that there's a difference between orchestrating the underlying hardware and the runtimes deployed to it. Versus orchestrating and you know managing clusters, for example, in band with that that Kubernetes distribution, a lot of people don't think about the underlying orchestration because when you're in a data center, you you could be scripting to a handful of servers, no problem. You get the basis going, cool. But try to do scripting for a thousand devices in the field, you know, good luck. And so that's where the tools they have to have a different uh, scale consideration, of course. But also, as mentioned, there's the security factors where. You know, so like uh, Evil S is, a, is a, a tool that we leverage from Linux Foundation, um, LF Edge. Evil S was built specifically for the needs of distributed edge, where it's it's not only Linux, it's got embedded hypervisors so I can run legacy workloads. There's a lot of legacy out there. Uh, zero trust security down to silicon, measured boot, remote attestation, uh, crypto ID, so you have no local username and password. Um, that's another problem. People just kind of walk up and log into the box and you know start loading stuff on, and so it's kind of like this grounds up um, you know point. And so it's it's important to think about which edge before you start talking about what orchestration tools. I think is is the net message. And while it seems that they're they're you know things can be applicable across the board, there are very very different considerations. Um, so, so I mean. 
to answer the Cubedge question is, I think Cubedge is a really great effort, you know, open source effort, but it also, um, I think that there's there's some gaps that other tools can help fill. And, you know, what we'd like to see is communities kind of collaborating to solve those core problems so then we can focus on the value. Right. So um, in, in how we are looking at the orchestration piece, there is, as um, Jason mentioned, the infrastructure level. The, the hardware, the bare metal servers, or the, the infrastructure at multiple locations and the network connectivity. How do you make sure you, you do that orchestration to do that? One key thing is that we need grouping mechanisms so that you have like a single way of, you know, you know, you know logging into all these different distributed locations with the, 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 the compute servers, the storage, the security devices, the interconnection fabric, all of that. How do you, at the infrastructure level, basically orchestrate that because it's hard. Otherwise you have to have multiple calls to different vendors and, and you have to maintain so many different credentials. It's not that easy. So infrastructure level orchestration and also clouds because clouds are also, it's hybrid solutions. In most cases, it's not just a standalone solution. So the infrastructure level orchestration, you need grouping mechanisms so that for log aggregation, for you know authentication, uh, for security policy setting. So that is something that I think the standards groups can help. Then you also as as Jason said, you have the Kubernetes or container level, the service meshes that for that level also you need to do the orchestration. And then also at the, the application level now, for example, for AI, you're getting these federated AI orchestration frameworks. So, so there is a cube fate and, and, and there, there is a, you know, a federated TensorFlow, there is a, you know, Pi Sift, and there, there are many of such orchestration frameworks that are coming that are helping to orchestrate the application at the application level on a cloud native you know, platform so that you train the model here, you inference the model there, et cetera. So, so basically you have layers of orchestrators that are required in order to basically then finally be able to deploy a distributed, you know, video surveillance application that is spanning across multiple locations. So, so basically orchestration, when I think of orchestration, uh, there are different layers right now that people have to go through to get really what they need to get. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot uh, for, for those insights. I think we have about two, three minutes left. Uh, and uh, I'd like to get to the closing part, uh, which let's see if we can fit it in three minutes. So let's imagine that, let's sound, try to summarize it, uh, this discussion. And if I'm an engineer who is trying to solve the problem, uh, can you try to give me one best piece of advice uh, for, based on your experience? And yeah, let's start with you, Max. I think the most critical piece that I would mention again is making sure to abstract the underlying infrastructure away. Make sure you're not locked into the easy button, uh, into that one provider that just makes it the easiest hello world, as Jason said. But you actually think about, okay, if we might be able to move this, if we might need to move this around in the future, how would we enable that? And I think that level of, of abstraction can be really important um, as this whole edge continuum keeps developing more and more. Yeah, I, mean, I agree that the, the biggest challenge with any of these things is, is balancing long-term flexibility and, and potential with easy button. And it's very attractive to just kind of latch on to PaaS services and start building stuff. But when you think about the long-term potential and, and you know, once you get the bill after the data starts flowing, you're, you're going to really want to have those abstractions. We see this all the time with customers that are, you know, initially they jump to a cloud centric model. They leverage the services, really, really good services. But at the same time, then they, they realize the practical realities of the bandwidth consumption or that they, they are losing control of their data, you know, because the, the cloud's multi-cloud strategy is send me all your data and then you can pay me, pay me more money to send it anywhere you'd like. If you abstract it, at the edge and you impart trust into it, now you, you're you in control of wherever it goes, whether it's you know, to specific clouds, other on-prem systems. You know, it's, it is important to find that balance between easy button and um, uh, flexibility, but there's also more and more offers coming out where basically people are building edge as a service where you get easy button and that flexibility. So that, that's, a, that's a classic you know <laughs> challenge I think for developers is, yeah. Thank you, Jason. And uh, Cal, uh, in the last, well, last one minute, like, <laughs> sure. you're, you're, you're sure. it off. Sure. Uh, I would say I, I want to echo Max's point, which is 
go to the edge make sure you really have to go to the edge <laughs> otherwise i think the, the right now for about 80% of the use cases i think metro edge is good uh, it can satisfy your latency requirements uh, so and it's much easier to deploy as as jason said you can deploy your containers you can deploy your cloud native infrastructure and manage it uh, pretty easily uh, so i would i would recommend them to pay close attention and see whether they can satisfy it in that situation yeah. awesome all right, uh, Max, Kyle, Jason, thanks a lot for the discussion and uh, thanks a lot for all the attendees.